to this passage that we've uh, had held before us through the video and, and these scriptures, we're gonna we're gonna look primarily at the uh, at the prodigal son of the. Ah, oh, yeah! I was whistling. I didn't. Yes, the kids are invited to go find wonderful resources. That great. Yeah, so are. There you go. Quick. The morning was going so well till I messed up. Oh, some parents are going, oh, better. Well, that gives you an opportunity to find out where you are on the map in the scripture. So here's the question for you this morning. I want you to recall a time when you were lost. Maybe this last week or something, you were dry, trying to get someplace and, and uh, you know, MapQuest wasn't working out or, or, you know, recalculate, you know, all that was going on. Um, what are the things associated with being lost for you? For some people, it's, it's fear. We kind of got that, uh, we got tuned up with that. For some folks, it's frustration. It's like, why can't this be easier? What's going on? Why, why am I lost here? What's happening to me? So as you're thinking about, uh, as you're thinking about that, I would just remind you that these uh, three people in our story, and I've just kind of, I wanted to update it a little bit, so I call them the three deplorables of this beloved story, each experience lost, and the feeling of being lost as they're in this story. They're quite a bit like us, as we experienced last week. This is why Jesus tells stories. Because if we just went off and told people what they should do, well, you know how that feels. Now, we go ahead and do that to others, but we never like it done to us. So what Jesus does is he walks in, sneaks into that life, and says, I've got a story for you. In this case, he tells three. But we're going to look at the deplorables. In fact, Jesus himself is considered a deplorable because of the company that he keeps. The very first of, the, of, of this story starts um, in the first verse of the chapter. Now tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around him to hear. See, they, there was a time in which all the deplorables were trying to get the seats from all of the non-deplorables in church. There was a day when Jesus walked the earth that scroungy people wanted to be around Jesus. We're so far from that day today. I wonder why. It, it begs the question, because when we look at this and we see this, it says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus actually loves sinners. He not only taught us to do it, but he actually does it. He finds the, the people that are, that are on the block that no one wants to be with, and he is being with them. It causes us to ask the question, well, if it's not the sinners, if it's not the enemies, if it's not the deplorables, then who are we trying to reach anyway? And how would we reach them? By being all angry and, and telling them off or being all loving and sharing our story? And furthermore, how did we get in the seats? Who loved you or me? Who made Jesus accessible to us? Not because they... But because they... Paul says in Romans 5, 6, and 8, you see, at just the right time, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How did it turn out that it's not them against us, but it's us against them. What has happened? 
in the world that, that, that has made this come about. And so we have a story. The story that we can relate to in all of its characters in, in, in three easy points for a great summer sermon. Point number one. We are all like the younger son, squandering grace. You see, in our story, the son, the younger son, risks losing everything. And because this is a familiar story, I'm going to ask you to, I'll just point to a few verses. We won't, we won't read the whole thing again. You see, being determined, the younger son becoming humble. Being determined to get his own way, he's becoming humble. Watch what happens. You know this story as well as I do. He seeks an early inheritance. Basically, a modern translation would be saying, Hey, Dad, I hate you. Die and give me your money. Doesn't get any bolder than that. That's the only way he could get his inheritance, is to proclaim that his father was dead to him. This is outright rebellion. It says then that he turns the valuable assets into quick money. You know what's going on here? He goes for a short sale on something that's very, very valuable. He doesn't even get the worth of his property. He pawns it so he can have this cash. And then because he's so determined that his plan is right, but God's working to make him humble, he goes off to a distant country and he squanders it. He finds himself in such a horrible place that he's feeding the pigs. And, and Jesus now starts using the power of story. Because a Jew working with pigs was like, no, 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 no. That can't happen here. But Jesus starts to sneak that in. It is so bad that he's working with unclean pigs. That's how bad it is. And then... In a moment of light, he comes to his senses in two ways. The first is, I think I'll go home and just get a job from my dad. I can live in the bunkhouse. I don't, I'm not worthy to be a son anymore. But then something happens along the way. And I, can, I don't want to tell the dad's story yet. And I don't want to tell the older son's story. But suffice it to say, by the time he sees his dad, and everything that has transpired since he has been gone, he just breaks down and goes, oh, Dad, I'm sorry, can I be your son? So even what started off as a, a self-determined plan to get back into the good graces and, and just get a job turns into the melting of the son's heart, being determined, becoming humble. So the second part is we are like the father offering gullible grace. You see, the father is risking his dignity. He looks like a pushover. This isn't anything like the father that raised me. That's a whole other thing. You see, giving freedom, he's becoming faithful. Now, you're going to have to follow the text here very carefully. I found out something I never knew. And... Uh, we're going to follow this up tomorrow morning in our men's Bible study. We're going to go back. See, to, to read this story, you would have had to go back to the story of Esau and Jacob. So we're going to do that in, in the Old Testament at the coffee shop tomorrow. It be hard to get in the Old Testament. But there's something powerful going on here. Because the first big shot, it, shock is that the father goes along with the plan. The father says, okay, let's do it your way. Now, now, this is amazing in patriarchal society. It's amazing today. Refusing to control his son, refusing to justify his anger. I'm the dad here. Now we're back to my childhood. You can't do this to me. All of those things the father refuses to do. And it's like a shock. That's why this is a story. We've never seen anyone act like this. There's a bigger shock than that, though. I, I want you to, to, to make sure that you've underlined um, verse 12. 
I'm going to read it for you. And listen very carefully. I'm going to read it twice. So he divided the property between them. Did you notice? I'm going to say it again. He divided the property between them. He gave the other son his inheritance too. Oh, what's going on here? Hadn't thought about that. So I went back in some of those old dusty books on my shelf. and I, how, do, how do they do that? What, what, what's going on? And, 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 and where does that kind of, kind of work itself out? In, in terms of this larger story. Well, you see, the elder son who stayed home would have got two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger son that went would have gotten one-third of the inheritance, which would have let the, let the father be poor before his two sons. And at their beck and call. What's going on? Well, there's even a bigger shock. Because when the son comes home, when the younger son comes home, two things happen. Well, they happen in one action, okay? It says, but while he was a long way off, the father saw him with compassion for him, and here's the optimal word, circle this, ran to his son threw his arms around him, and kissed him. In Jewish society, an elder never ran to a younger, or ran after a younger in order to get him. You just didn't do that. That was like, you know, uh, for, for an old man to pick up his skirts and run after a young man. It would have been so humiliating, so wrong. Now, the second thing about this story that I find really fascinating is that the father runs to the son to comfort him and, check this out, protect him. Because the village would have honor killed the son for the way he treated the father. Got that? That's a, that's a new term we're learning as the world gets smaller. The village would have pounced on him and given his comeuppance because of the way he treated the dad and the way he treated the village in respect to the dad and the way he treated the religion and the temple and God in all of that. And the dad protects the son. Wow. This is kind of becoming a cool story. I'm thinking this should be in our Bibles. I'm, I'm thinking, maybe we should read stories like this. Thought number three, maybe we could act like this. In the face of our enemies, or our neighbor, or our families, in our churches, anywhere in the world where we would like to just safely cut it, my team, their team, us, and them. Jesus is all about blowing that up. Finally, we are like the older son who resents grace. He's risking gaining everything but grace. Did you notice how sly the older brother was when the, when the property was getting divided and he got two and the son got one? He said nothing. Such a sweet deal. He had felt like the younger son all of his life. Never really liked dad. But he wasn't going to say it because there was money involved. So he lets the younger one who knows no better say it. And he gets double the negative benefit from just shutting his trap. And get everything that the punk got. For saying everything that the stuffy brother was holding in his heart. Wow. You see, now the brother begins to open his mouth and he says, Father, you never gave me a party. I never got all the good stuff. And now it makes sense because you know the truth of the story. He goes, Son, it's all yours. 
You got the checkbook, the deeds. You got everything. You don't know how to live with grace. You don't know how to live with everything if it was all given to you. You've acted for all these months in as much rebellion as our, as my youngest son and, and your younger brother. It's all yours. You stuffed it under a mattress someplace. You confined it to some culturally irrelevant, you can't do this and I can do that. And, and, and you were so fastidious about what was right religiously that you couldn't enjoy the party of living with your poor dad and taking care of him. Mercy sakes. This is amazing. So by way of application, the deplorables risk not only the, the, the sense of, of losing it all or, 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 or their dignity or gaining it all and losing themselves. You see, the younger son, it was certainty. He was certain that he had a plan. And he had to risk that certainty, just like we do. I want to remind all of us this morning that it usually takes our most thought through B plan to fall apart so that we can find God's A plan. You see, you've heard this before. Our setback is God's setup for our comeback. That's what God's doing. Your setback, you, whatever setback you're working with today, it is God's setup for your comeback. We're, we're all the younger son. And, and, and the father, he risks connection. He, he's not sure he, he can let go of his two sons, but he does. Can we let go of stuff? Or are we holding it so tight? And as is appropriate to the story, and connected usually when I heard the story, we so relate to the older son, who's all about controlling. You see, trying to put it all together. You see, do we, in our day and age, really want the Lordship of Jesus, or do we want our plan to work out? Do you want to be right, or do you want to be righteous? And they're not the same. The story is a cliffhanger, right? It's left on this cliff. Will the older son join the party? Will the dad keep loving these two sons unconditionally, regardless if they get it or not? Will the young son, when he, he's now home, he's got the job, he's got his room back, will he really become a true and devoted son? It's the same for us. We're the same deplorables hanging off the same cliff. The point of life is not staying alive. It's staying in love. Do you get that? The, the point is not paying the bills. The point is not all the stuff that we're after. The point of life is staying in love with God. Staying in love with our friends and neighbors in the church. Staying in love with our enemy. Staying in love with ourselves. How much we live self-condemning lives, as well as all the other people we judge all the time. And half the time, God, because he's not getting it right either. And so the point of life is not getting it all together down here. It's learning to love regardless of what gets put together. And so I would encourage us this morning to, to find that 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 that. Identify the piece of deploriality that's in you that you can grab right now. Don't go for the deep dark when that you weigh too much and give up by Tuesday. Take some part of the deplorable nature that you know you walk with this morning and offer it to God. I read the other week that pride prevents us from admitting we're wrong. Well, boy, they really make that sound bad, don't they? That was supposed to be fun. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying this week. We don't mind that our pride kind of lets us take a step back and we're always right and we're never wrong. But here's the thing. 
Pride also never allows us to get healed. You don't go, you see, you can't, you can't get the medicine unless it's diagnosed. And I very few of us go into the doctor's office and sit on the table and, and the doctor says, what's wrong? I go, will you tell me? <laughs> you know, I'm, it's my secret. You figure it out and heal me. It'll never happen that way. You already know what's wrong. You know the, the depth and the breadth of your deporeality or however I say that. I just make up words, you know. <laughs> but God knows, and God wants us to see what's deep, deep, deep within. Let's pray together. Jesus.